remember you in your glasses uh, matching your outfit, giving a keynote speech at one of the events that I attended approximately three years ago. Mm -hmm. What happened since? Imagine you're driving, you're almost flying at that speed and then you're like, break, it's not going to work. But you did build a very successful business though. Absolutely, but what was the price? It looked beautiful on the outside, right. but it felt terrible on the inside. Nobody said it was easy. Do you have to compromise on your authenticity at any point of time when you're in public? Being really you is the best foundation for turning into a client magnet. Nowadays, I primarily see myself as a flawsome human being. There was a moment when you decided to go in public. Language. Very often we communicate from an energy of violence or fear. My accent is terrible. I can't talk in full sentences. What if I forget the text? What if I sweat? What if I stumble? What if people will judge me? What if I say something stupid? Being courageous means doing things although we are scared. I was dying 50,000 deaths in that second. I need to become a public speaker. And no matter what it takes, I will train for the next one and a half years. I will write a speech. I will train a speech. I will get feedback on a speech. And that's what I did. <laughs> yep. Well... And we're having Natalia Vyhovsky in our studio today, who's got a very interesting personal and professional story from a LinkedIn unicorn and award-winning author to an authenticity coach. And I, what I've been uh, impressed about Natalia is about the audience, the way she positions herself in public, the ways her channels are organized, and we're gonna discuss all of it in today's episode. Hi, Natalia, it's great having you in Ports Studio. It's been years since I've been following you on LinkedIn and I'm having your life <laughs> at Potster. So excited. How are you today? Thank you so much, Larissa, for this beautiful introduction, for taking the time and for having me over. I'm, I'm doing great and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Well, I remember you in your glasses uh, matching your outfit, giving a keynote speech at one of the events that I attended approximately three years ago. Mm -hmm. What happened since? Ooh, three years. How much time do we have? Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> three years ago, as you said, I was focusing on LinkedIn, LinkedIn marketing, social selling, the art of personal branding and helping entrepreneurs in these areas. So how do I get more clients? How do I get more visibility? How can I stand out through my written text, but also through the way how I dress, how I move, how I talk and to live what I preach or to show people what can be done. I decided to lead by example, and that's why I chose these glasses. And that's why I allowed myself to be a little bit crazy to play with this unicorn character. And that worked out pretty well for many, many years. Yeah. I think you actually, you succeeded in that, uh, you know, LinkedIn uh, content creation, consistency, the audience growth, and I understand uh, in your business as well. So what was your business back then? So my business back then was helping coaches, trainers, mentors and topic experts to build a bigger audience and to lead through thought leadership and all of that based on organic content marketing and especially content that came from the soul. Yeah, of course, it's also about teaching other people, but it was a lot about authenticity. It was a lot about connecting and having the courage to show who they truly are, because I do believe that being really you is the best foundation for turning into a client magnet. And this way it's easier to attract who you are and what you want instead of using a lot of force and doing the traditional way of hustle and grinding and you have to fight for it and work, work, work. 
why is so difficult and it can be easier wh- through or while tapping into the natural energy of who you are? Uh, interesting. So um, how would you describe uh, your personal brand? Because I think personal brand is something that you were coaching or you were teaching people to build mm. on LinkedIn back then. And how has your personal brand has transformed to what you're doing today? Mm-hmm. So nowadays, I primarily see myself as a flawsome human being. Okay. Flawsome means full of flaws and nevertheless awesome, or maybe because of that awesome. What does that mean? For me, I feel that a lot of people nowadays are paralyzed by the fear of being perfect and they don't start and they maybe never do things or don't dare things because of the fear of being judged or humiliated or taken out of the group. And a lot of these fears are deeply rooted in us. They are part of our subconscious programming. And somebody needs to stand up and change that. And I believe in being the change we wish to see in the world, as Gandhi supposedly once said. So I give my best to go out there, talk about my fears and insecurities and doing things anyway, because I do believe that being courageous means doing things although we are scared. So nowadays I see myself rather as a inner truths guide. So it's about being authentic to oneself and expressing who you truly are and reconnecting with your inner compass, if you believe in the soul, reconnecting with your soul. And through that, being more genuine, more honest and co-creating the life that you want. Uh, that's absolutely, I mean, uh, that's an interesting, interesting topic for me to to, to dive uh, deep into. I just want to ask you a little bit, if you go backwards, so how would you compare yourself to your uh self let's say seven years ago when you started linkedin and when you built your professional linkedin brand mm. what was it back then and basically i think that the the big thing between natalia seven years ago and natalia currently is the authenticity that you gained Absolutely. but what was your brand back on linkedin my brand was very professional right it was infused with a lot of male energy or right. yang energy which means a lot of structure a lot of order a lot of rules a lot of teaching there was not much space for flexibility for flow for femininity there was a dash of playfulness but i never dared to fully express myself and to fully talk about my fears because I did not owe my, yeah, my deepest fears or the things that I haven't fully integrated yet. So, I mean, the major difference is that right now I'm not afraid of failure anymore. In the past, I I had all of these stories about, I need to make money and I need to be successful. I need to impress people. I need, and I have to, da, 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 da. And right now I feel that I've reached a phase, a a state of being where everything is a bonus and optional. So when you come from that level of energy or from that level of self-awareness, business, guiding people, everything becomes more like a dance or like a game and everything becomes so much easier. So I feel that the new Natalia gives people the real permission to be themselves and promotes balance and harmony within ourselves. Uh, That's great. But you did build a very successful business though. Absolutely. But what was the price? The price was disconnecting from my emotions. The price was not being able to fall asleep. The price was continuous inflammation, was terrible skin, was not much time with my friends and family, was not being able to fully creatively express myself. So it looked beautiful on the outside, but it felt terrible on the inside. So my brand was called Think Natalia. That's right. And that's why the brand had to die because I was putting way too much effort into the thinking part instead of in the feeling part. So yeah, 
I changed a lot from how things look like. Although I know in the world that we live in 3D reality, it's important how things look like. It's about marketing, presenting yourself. But we tend to, I feel, way too often forget about the part, how do I feel? And when we don't feel good about it, or when we reach the state of being where we don't feel anything at all, I think this is dangerous. And I observe that this is something that unfortunately is happening quite a bit globally. I guess my main uh, question, I'm just trying to uh, sort of build a a little bit of a confidence of myself and also probably the audience that is listening to that, we definitely, we very often we as human beings are going through the stage where we need to put a lot of uh, energy into, you know, structure, thinking, commitment uh, to be able to achieve some certain, you know, tangible results that we call them, be it a, um, be it a career, be it an audience growth and audience growth is a big issue, right? You're competing with so many creators. Uh, I mean, the multiple different things behind that are forcing us to be uh, whoever we are on the front level, mm. but not everybody has the courage to sort of step up from a successful business and change it into something uh, that probably requires time, uh, requires some time to pick up as a business, as a business model, as something that can bring you the uh, real income. So what was that moment? And uh, when did you change? How did it happen? And what you're doing now? So my uh, word that I'm associating you with now is the authenticity. I called you like an authenticity coach. Okay, mm -hmm. so let's discuss the authenticity. And how did you come to that? Yeah, so as you said, after seven years of really guiding people when it comes to questions of so social selling and content marketing, marketing and being a thought leader on LinkedIn, I realized that I felt very angry. I woke up one morning and I thought, ah, I channeled my inner Hulk and I realized, gosh, this is really not healthy. So I talked to a couple of coaches and mentors and I realized, you know what? there is something that I'm not getting because I do believe in the universe and I do believe that the universe is here to help us. It's a kind universe and it wants us to grow. So it usually whispers through our soul and tells us, hey, you man, look to the right or, you know, go to the left. And I was ignoring that for a very long time. So I realized in the current environment and setting that I've built for myself, there's no way how I'm going to get out of it. So this is why I decided to go on a sabbatical for nine months, say goodbye to all of our clients or temporary goodbye, say goodbye or I need a break to our suppliers, to our PR partners, to our affiliate partners. I mean, stopping our ads and uh, making sure that nobody gets access to our online classes and master courses and whatnot. So I think I needed almost five months to close all of that or to, to shut machine. it down, that machine. I really felt like one of the fastest trains on this planet. I don't know how much the fastest trains are, most probably like 350 kilometers per hour. So imagine you're driving, you're almost flying at that speed and then you're like, brake, it's not going to work. So every day I made sure I stepped on the brake a little bit more until I then reached my sabbatical. And during that sabbatical, my gift for myself was to do less and to be more and to really be honest with myself and see what was missing. And I realized that I was totally disconnected from my emotions because I judged my emotions and I judged especially femininity and true womanhood and everything that was related to that. So I really had to go deep to figure out where my wrong beliefs are, where my child, where my inner wounds were uh, replace them with a new truth, with new beliefs, and then at the end of it, come out with the true Natalia. And I decided to take my audience on a journey of that. So I kept on blogging, or I kept on writing, uh, especially on LinkedIn and Instagram. Well, at the end of it came a new Natalia, a book that is out right now. And hopefully the Hopefully it gives people hope or encourages people to say no to whatever they have built if in the core of their hearts they're not feeling in alignment. Because I feel that no job, no title, no whatever it is, it doesn't matter how much money it gives you, it doesn't matter how prestigious it is, if you have to abandon a huge part of yourself, it is not 
worth it because you're going to pay the price and the price is life force energy. You will feel depleted, you will feel old and it will manifest in many different areas in your life. So have the courage and take the jump. So bare-faced authenticity. Exactly. Is there an easy answer to finding your authenticity? Well, if it was easy, everybody would do it, right? Probably. I think it was Coldplay who said, nobody said it was easy. So what does authenticity mean? For me, authenticity means being an original, being truthful, being unique. And I write unique, Y-O-U hyphen N-I-Q-A-E. The easy in quotation marks way is to start with 10 minutes per day, 10 minutes that you gift yourself with. Mm -hmm. And these 10 minutes do something that is all about self-love or self-respect, self-appreciation. If it is getting a glass of water or a cup of coffee or tea and just staring out of the window, do that. If it is doing a mindfulness exercise, it's that. If you want to journal, journal. If you want to sing, sing. If you want to dance, dance. Do something where you reconnect to that precious inner core, to what fills you with joy, to what makes you feel, I'm finally out of my head, out of this inner judge that tries to say, oh, you're stupid, you should this, why are you doing this, da, 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 where you really can be. And you know, then slowly increase from 10 minutes to 15 minutes to 20 minutes. And if you say, you know what, mm -mm, get a coach, get a mentor, somebody who takes you by the hand, who has been through whatever you will go through and who holds your hand, who accompanies you and makes yeah. the whole transformation easier. That's right. And is it something that you are helping people to do now? Absolutely. So, so yeah. you are basically, you are taking people by their hands and uh, walking through them uh, a journey of uh, finding the true selves. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so uh, the question uh, that I'm trying to ask here probably, so does your previous business sort of help you to to transform uh, the services that you were doing previously to uh, what you're doing now and how do you connect? Because basically to me, authenticity, uh, being true self, apart from the fact that you're probably feeling much better in your personal life, which is not connected with your social uh, self, with your social media self, let's say with your public self, mm. but authenticity is very much connected to that public self. Mm. So are you sort of in your sessions with your clients, are you connecting these two things or who are the clients who are coming to you and asking you for, you know, going on a journey of finding the authenticity? Mm -hmm. I give my best to show myself as authentic and human as I can be on social media. And of course, I will not talk about everything just to protect myself and my family. And when I write, I give my best to write from my heart. Of course, I also take my mind with me. I think that's a beautiful symbiosis. So by sharing stories and the pain that I have been through, a lot of people can relate and mm -hmm. they see themselves in me or they see a lost aspect of themselves or they see something that is screaming to be integrated. And then they approach me and say, Natalia, I'm finally ready. Please guide me and please help me in in being more like this or in finally owing this part. Oh, I'm so scared of this. Guide me when it comes to this aspect. So by being myself, by telling my stories, by also featuring the stories of people that I've worked with, uh, some people, they show their face and some people want to be anonymous. I feel that, again, it's about giving permission, but it's also by reminding people you are human and that's okay. And nobody is perfect. And through this energy and through these stories, the right people approach me or approach us. And to circle back to what you said initially, I feel that my old profession or job definitely helped me build an international network. I mean, on LinkedIn, I have what, I think 115,000 yeah. followers. Yeah, that's true. So that network is a beautiful, solid foundation that is worth so much more. I think it can be measured in, in money. 
And without that, things would be much more difficult. So I'm very grateful for the last seven That's years. Right. It was incredible. And now it's time to, to shift into something that is more in alignment with my real self. Yeah. I guess my question was mainly about have your client clients changed from what they used to be mm. to what they are now by it, changing the subject? Yeah. Interestingly enough, some of my old clients, they still want to work with me. They say, oh, it doesn't matter what you do. I love you. I think you're amazing. So even if you at a certain stage come up with something totally crazy, whatever that might be, I still want to work with you. But then there are also new people who approach me because in the past they felt, if I want to be radically honest, repelled by my... Um, some people would say arrogance. Some people would say dominance. So because I was partially insecure in who I truly am, I presented myself colder than I am today. So it was a little bit more, ah, Dr. Nat, the LinkedIn unicorn and blah, 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 blah. Well, now I feel I'm a little bit warmer. I'm a little bit more open. So through that, I feel that I... I definitely invite more people or maybe a different type of persona into my business. Yeah. Do you have to compromise on your authenticity at any point of time when you're in public? Right now? No, let me start that sentence again. I totally believe that love will always find a way. And I mean universal love. I mean universe love. So a question that one of my mentors gifted me with was what would God do? And I thought, <gasps> that's a big question. And who am I to dare to ask this question? And she said, relax, but try to get into that energy. If you were love, what would love do to find a solution? So get out of your ego, get out of, I want this, I want to achieve this. What can we do to find a fair compromise? So if I find myself in a situation where I feel, Ooh, I'm tiptoeing, then I give my best to understand what is my need? What do I need? What does the other person need? And how can we find a dance, a fair solution for both parties? Everybody must most probably say a little bit no here and a little bit yes here. And with that intention, everything is possible. So that's one thing. And the other thing I've learned is language. Very often we communicate from an energy of violence or fear. So when I find myself in a situation where I see, ooh, there's a little bit of tension, then I give my best to be even softer and more loving and more open and talk feeling language, not so much judgment or or demands, but more requests. And that helped me tremendously. Is there any practice behind? Because, uh, I mean, uh, I guess my question is here about, you cannot always overcome uh, emotions that are coming. Like different people might cause different feelings. Different situations might require, require you to be, uh, to react differently. And sometimes to be insecure. Some It's okay to be insecure. Okay. Sometimes to be protective. Mm. Uh, are there any practices that you're using that are helping you to sort of, first of all, get mindful or conscious about your emotions and then transform them into something that is more collaborative, more soft, something that probably transform any situation into, I don't know, a lesson probably. Mm -hmm. So as you said, mindfulness is very, very helpful for me because when I am mindful, I am in the present moment and that means I'm feeling into the energy in between us and I'm open. So as soon as I feel something is not good or yeah. off, I feel a closing and I see it in body language. I see it in, or I feel it, I experience it. And then I give my best to understand what is it, what's happening, what's happening, identify it, And the two things that I've learned from, I think it was Dr. Rosenberg, was what needs do you need that are not met at the moment? And what, what do you feel? As soon as I can identify that, I have a quick conversation with my inner self and I ask, is it a good idea to feel that right now? Or can we maybe park that until we're home? Or can we maybe 
let's say, answer and react professional or whatever, but then have an honest conversation with that person behind the scenes saying, right. when you did that, I felt scared or I felt abandoned. I felt disrespected. Um, and I guess it's it's a learning tool. For mm. now, I have not had a public situation in which I had to do that life in front of people. I don't know if the universe or life wants me to do that at a certain stage. Let's see. Yeah. And yeah, so I feel that mindfulness, staying open and really, really understanding what's happening and giving your best to see the other person as a human mm -hmm. and keeping the connection and relationship alive that is very, very helpful. So never see the other person as an enemy, but because when somebody is doing something too close, it very likely has something to do with the own perception of reality that the other human has and with their pain. So instead of feeling that, send them more love, as cliche as this sounds. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, it's definitely a practice in my, so in my feeling, it's a practice and it's a very mindful practice. So I want to uh, uh, touch a little bit on your public journey, mm -hmm. because you definitely have a huge public exposure mm -hmm. uh, that allowed you to build the audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, so as I mentioned several times, I was absolutely impressed about, uh, you know, all your channels and how they are interconnected in terms of the message, in terms of how you present yourself, mm -hmm. in terms of how you speak. Mm -hmm. Uh, no matter, for example, probably English is not your native language, but I mean, speaking it with grace and with confidence is uh, what I, for example, trying to address now with, uh, you know, a lot of content creators, me not being a, a native English speaker as well. I also have my own journey of how I came to speak in public in English mm -hmm. and with confidence. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be uh, really useful for a lot of people who are watching my episode specifically and for Dubai as well, mm. where we've got a, such a multinational environment. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the question is, there was a moment when you decided to go in public, mm -hmm. like you decided to, to record your first video, mm -hmm. you decided to, you know, to speak up because I, I saw you were doing a lot of video content. Mm -hmm. So what was your state of, uh, you know, speaking, state of mind, state of emotion, state of confidence at that particular moment? What were the fears? Mm -hmm. What did you overcome? Let's start with that. Mm -hmm. So when I quit my last job, I did a sabbatical after that. And during my first sabbatical, because the sabbatical we talked about was my second one. So I'm, I'm already have, or gifted myself that's with two good, sabbaticals. That's a good practice, right? <laughs> it is. And I mean, there are great TED talks out there about the art of doing or practicing sabbaticals, but let's not get sidetracked. So during the first sabbatical, I realized that I like to write and I started a blog and the blog was for me a success and it helped me process my reality, my thoughts, people liked it, they resonated with it. And at a certain stage, I bumped into a friend that I haven't seen for a year. And he said, oh, I've seen you quit your job. And now you're freelancing, writing a little bit here, blogging, modeling, creating content. What's your next step? And I said, uh, I don't know if I knew it and I would go ahead. And he said, I know what your next step is. And I said, would you be willing to share that with me? And he said, public speaking. And I thought, are you crazy? I'm German. No, 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 this is not going to happen. And he said, why not? And I said, well, first of all, again, because my accent is terrible, I can't talk in full sentences. What if I forget the text? What if I sweat? What if I stumble? What if people will judge me? What if I say something stupid? What if people will use that forever against me? What if nobody is ever going to hire me? And he said, yeah, why don't you join Toastmasters? And I didn't know the concept before. And I said, you know what? Let me just join for, for one, one event. And I was absolutely fascinated mm. by 
the power of speech. So basically what they don't tell you, and this is something to remember, when you go to a Toastmasters event for the first time, they they have the normal meeting, which is all about becoming a public speaker and be, being more confident in presenting in front of people. And they have different sections. So some people, they prepare the speech and then there are some people who evaluate the speech. And there is also a short section in which they pick somebody out of the audience. They put you on a stage in front of, let's say, 20, 30 other people. You have one minute and you have to talk about something. So they invited me to do that. And I thought, oh my goodness, oh no, and yes, and whatever. So long story short, I went there. They told me to deliver a one minute speech on the art of selfie. And I was dying 50,000 deaths in that second. And oh, it was crazy. Standing up, walking towards the stage, standing there literally shivering, sweat. <laughs> I mean, from all sort of pores, I felt humiliated and terrified and everything. And in that moment, I, in my head, had a conversation. I said, either this is going to be a total disaster and everybody's going to laugh about you and this will be one of the most painful moments in your life and you will need therapy, or you don't take that whole thing so seriously and just make a fool of yourself. This is not, these are not your enemies, these are your friends. I decided for B, I went all in and went super crazy. And within seconds, I won them over and everybody was laughing. Not about me, but because of me, they enjoyed that. And I felt so present. It was one of these aha moments when it feels as if the sky opens up, like, ah, this is how I felt. And I thought, I need to become a public speaker. And no matter what it takes, I will train for the next one and a half years. I will write a speech. I will train a speech. I will get feedback on a speech. And that's what I did. So you basically, you went on a public speaking journey. So you uh, you did the courses. Uh, how long were the courses? So back then, because I know the Toastmasters changed their programs right now, it was about basic steps that you needed to go. And then you could decide what kind of speech do you want to train? Do you want to go more into motivational speaking, inspirational speaking? Do you want to go into sales? What is it? Political speeches. So back then how it worked was I wrote a speech. I think it was a three minute speech. I trained it and then I delivered it. And that was every two weeks. And then I got feedback, watched it, listened to it and did that. And I did that for one and a half years until there was a message in my LinkedIn inbox which said, Dr. Natalia, we've seen that you're a fabulous speaker. We would like to book you for our event, 300 graduates, a speech of one and a half hours. And I thought, oh my God, people really want to book me as a speaker. And that's amazing. And they even offer me money for that. The problem was though, they wanted me to speak for one and a half hours. And I was just able to deliver a speech for three <laughs> minutes. <laughs> Yep. Well, but so was it another journey? But I would assume it's just uh, it's just a matter of scaling it right into uh, one hour and a half. No, it's a it's a it's a it's a fascinating story. I just wanted to your uh, so basically it took you one and a half years to get the first monetization of your public speaking journey investment. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. First of all, I have to tell you, so you're a true example of that investment was so worth it. Because I mean, no matter. I mean, you can you can you can do it practically. You can do it. You, you can do the practice regularly if that is required. But what I want to tell is just this is a true example of how a non-native English speaker can become a really fascinating public speaker. Uh, um, the question. So the first, the very speech, the, the very first speech that sort of encouraged you to get into that journey mm -hmm. where you sort of made yourself looking fun. What was the funniest joke about yourself that you allowed yourself to open up to the, if you remember it? Yeah, I remember that when I came to the Middle East, I was told that being very expressive and being emotional and loud is frowned upon. And especially as a woman, it's non-classy. So I didn't do that. I mean, I always was the clown in my family and at the party and whatever, I channeled my inner storyteller. But until then, I was never ever the 
Some people say I have a face like Jim Carrey or the Joker. I can do a lot of mimics <laughs> right. and I can also play with my voice. So I, for the first time back then, went into the rubber face uh, plasticity of my face and played with my eyebrows and my huge eyes, big mouth and talking faster and slower and with a pitch voice, low voice and doing these huge movements and really... I, I would even say channel my inner idiot and having fun and people felt that. So it was not so much what I said with my words, but it was more what I said with my mimics and gestures and body language. And especially at this was not expected, I feel this is what did the whole boom and wow effect. Yeah. Uh, do you have any acting background by any chance? I don't, but I was a dancer for, for 10 years. So oh, right. I feel that dancing definitely helped me with that. Yeah, yeah. feeling yourself on the stage. Uh, yeah, definitely. That probably built the confidence. Because uh, So my message is probably, yes, so this is one of the techniques you can make, sort of you can channel your inner child exactly. your inner i mean fool you, you, yeah, or however fool, you want to call it yeah that part of your probably personality if you feel courageous enough exactly. for example to open up uh, uh, in public and even if you are not confident in terms of how you speak at least you know sense of humor uh connects you with the audience absolutely uh, yeah and just try it in a probably I don't know, in a probably friendly, safe environment. Absolutely. Uh, like First. a training, for example. Exactly. But, yeah. exactly. yeah, great. Uh, so the public speaking journey, the first public, uh, uh, you know, the first keynote, uh, that uh, that invitation uh, that was paid as well. And, and since then, so how long was your journey in terms of the public speaking? So it was several years, perhaps you used to do... You used to do regular conferences? Exactly. Conferences, events, workshops, then later on trainings. And it started in English and then it flipped into German. And that was quite interesting because I remember that my first German speech, when I stood on a German stage in Munich, everybody thought that I was Canadian because <laughs> I it's, it's crazy because I hadn't spoken German for such a long time that my word flow and the pronunciation, it was German, it was pure German, but there was an English vibe into it. So people would approach me and say, wow, for a Canadian, you have real good English. And I said, dude, I'm from Hanover. But uh, yeah, so that was huge for me. Um, which means speaking in German and in English, but also different types of events or different, no, not events, different types of speeches. And I also tried the moderator role a couple of times or emceeing, also very interesting and talked on different continents. I mean, I, I spoke in North America, I spoke in Asia and the Middle East in Europe, um, online even in Africa. And it was beautiful to see that there is a language that everybody understands and the language is human and the language is love. Just tell me more about it. So I wanted to ask you to, first of all, do you enjoy uh, your public speaking exposures, let's say your gigs where you need to, to speak in public? And uh, so what is that? What is that language that helps you to connect with the audience now? Uh, what are those things behind that connection. Mm -hmm. So before every speech, I give my best to have a longer conversation with the event organizer or the host and really ask, what is the goal here? What are the problems and the fears of your audience? If there is one core message that you want me to deliver, what is it? And when I have that, I give my best to then collect stories or anecdotes that people can relate to. I also give my best to speak a language that the audience understands. So if I speak, for example, in front of 200 engineering students, I would use a total different language and examples that if I talk in front of a group of 10 female entrepreneurs, different examples, different language. Why? Because my job is to connect. My job is not to impress or show people how amazing I am. It's really about inspiring them and empowering them and building a connection and reminding them of their own humanness. And I feel that 
The easiest way is, again, through stories and through entering people's hearts, but also being open and vulnerable enough and, and showing them, I'm not the usual or average speaker. I'm not your teacher to tell you what to do. I've learned that people have the answers. I have the questions. So I give my best to live or be by example. I hand out invitations. I give my best to share my energy, my love, my insights. And I'm not telling anybody what to do. And people sense that. And at the end, you know, if there's just one person who decides to stop smoking or regularly go into the gym or start meditating or finally read that book or whatever it is, if I could just inspire or empower one person to change for the better, my job is done. And what are the sort of typical themes or topics that are offered for your keynotes mm. nowadays? So what are you talking about LinkedIn, about business or about authenticity or about, some, I mean, personal growth, brands? I mean, there's so many, obviously. Mm. So in the past, as you said, it was more that. Just recently, I delivered a speech on the art of creativity, because what I hear over and over again is that people feel stuck or they feel disconnected. They feel uninspired. And I feel that this has a lot to do with being stuck in our minds and with too much structure and order. So that was quite interesting to get people back into a level of playfulness or of childlike curiosity. So I did that and I realized that's nice, but it doesn't really open or, or I, it was it was lovely, but it was not 100% what I want. So I said, you know what, let me take a break from speaking. Let me really focus more on writing. And then let's see how the whole thing evolves. A vision that I have for myself in the very near future is to not be a, let's say, classical keynote speaker, but I want to tap even more into the edutainer role, edutainment in the sense of education and entertainment. So in the near future, I'm flirting with the idea, and I don't know if it's going to happen, to create more an experience for people in which they they open their hearts. So maybe we will sing together, maybe we will dance together, right. maybe we will... The core idea for me is to get people into their body and into their senses. So can I see something? Can I smell something? Can I hear something? Can I touch something? And uh, remind them of what it means to truly be and be human. So I know that if this is my path and if this is what I'm here to do, it will manifest itself. But at the moment, I don't panic. I don't worry about it. And let's see what happens. That's great. How do you prepare yourself for the public speaking engagements? Like, for example, if you need to deliver a speech or, for example, today's interview, mm -hmm. was there any practice that you're using to uh, uh, sort of to get yourself uh, ready to speak up? Mm -hmm. So, first of all, we had a conversation before that, did, right? Yes, so yes. I said, who's your target audience? What's the goal? What, what are we going to talk about? And you provided me with a handful of ideas. So I sat down and I brainstormed and asked myself what would be a truthful answer, but also what would be an anecdote or a story. So this is what I always do. And then I wait a few days, then I go back into it and see, is that really true? Is there anything else I could come up with? That's the foundation. And then I always make sure, if it's possible, to gift myself with a beautiful morning. So I have delicious breakfast. I'll celebrate myself. I go to the hairdresser, get my hair done, make sure that I wear something that I really like to make sure on different levels that I feel I'm stepping into my queendom and into my ultimate energy to make this a beautiful experience for everybody involved yeah no for sure i think experience is very important and uh and specifically when you need to talk about things like authenticity i mean regardless of the topic really any public speaking exposure i think i mean if you agree but i think it's a big stress for a human being to go out there and expose yeah. yourself. Yeah, so yeah. I don't know, probably it's natural for those who've got uh, those acting experiences or who are naturally uh, were born to become actors or feel natural on the stage. But mm. apart from that, for an average human being, it's a big stress. 
and you know, getting yourself into a practice or routine that allows you to feel comfortable with yourself. Uh, I think that's very important. I don't know, to me, it's a stress, but at the same time, it's such a relief when you do it. Mm. You feel really satisfied with what you've done. I don't know, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I read somewhere many, many years ago that it's the most natural thing to feel a little bit nervous or excited before a big speech or an interview and that this is just a parameter that shows you that you really care. If you go somewhere and you deliver a speech or you're interviewed and you don't feel anything, that's a dangerous sign in the sense that, wait, hmm, maybe you're not really excited about that anymore. Maybe there is something to look at in the sense of, do you want to shift? And so acknowledging that you are a little bit nervous or you're experiencing stage fright or however you want to label that, it's the most natural thing on this planet. It's human. It shows that you care. Kudos to you. Now, next step, what can you do to make your life easier? I've learned that the body and the mind are connected. So when we're nervous, we're usually in our head and the head tells all of these stories of what could happen and I'm panicking, oh my God, ah! So when you can, or when we can slow down our thoughts, we can feel better in our body. And how do we slow down our thoughts? Through mindfulness, through meditation, through breath work. So you don't need to be a yogi and you don't need to be a monk. You can literally go into any social media platform and have a look at a short exercise or a practice of three minutes, five minutes, whatever it is, choose one that works for you and literally breathe and you will feel so much better. I mean, there's studies which prove that. It's not woo-woo, it's not spiritual, it is yeah. solid data and facts. Regulate how you breathe, reconnect to your body and your mind will stop talking and it will get you into the present moment. It's basically the same about the speech. I mean, yeah. articulation is the same kind of muscle, right? Yeah. So you can just train in the same as you're doing a warm up before a big training, for example. So it's the same thing. Yeah. Uh, so I have two probably last questions. Uh, so one would be, uh, since podcasting uh, is very much popular in the Middle East, if you were to start your own podcast, what would it be? Oh, I would most probably invite people that I feel deeply inspired by who give their best to be as truthful and loving as they can be. So most probably the podcast would be something along the lines of the journey to wholeness. So interviewing people and talking about my own journey of some people would call it inner child work or shadow integration, overcoming wounds or childhood trauma, anything that gives other people the permission to be human and encourages them to do the inner work. It would be something along these lines. Would it be in English or in German? Most probably in English to reach more people. Yeah. Right. Interesting. No, uh, I think it's a, uh, it's a super interesting niche for sure. And uh, what would be your recommendation? I know you don't like to tell people what to do, but what would be your sort of reflection recommendation to those who would like to start their public speaking journey? Let's not, let's not call it a public speaking, but let's call it a public exposure, any type of public exposure journey. What mm -hmm. would be your piece of advice? First of all, get the basics done. So understand why do you want to do that? And is this truly what you want to do? And understanding the motivation, the experiences behind it. Because when you don't know why or when your why is not solid enough, then when you will experience hiccups, it will be difficult for you to get back into it and stay motivated. So having a solid why do I want to do this? What's the ultimate goal? Super important. So once we have that, next basis or the next, let's say, layer is why me? What do I have to offer? What makes me different? What makes me unique? How do I want to be perceived? How do I want to make people feel? So the basic questions of branding or personal branding are a must. In the end, 
I do believe in what Paul Watzlawick said, you cannot not communicate, everything is communication. So when your internal communication with yourself, when there is no clarity, when there's a lot of confusion, you're going to project that into the outside world. That's why for me, it's an absolute must to get the inner clarity, the inner structure, the inner aha first, and then repackage that and send it out to the universe, to your community, to your audience it will make a huge, massive difference. That what I've learned over the last seven years with so many people that are coached and guided and trained, get the basics done as annoying or painful it can be. If you can't do it on your own, again, get a mentor, get a coach, get a trainer, whatever, because it's like building a house. You can't build a house on solid sand. You need the foundation. Please don't stop with curtains or the chimney. Start with what kind of piece of land where on this planet do I want to have and why? That's yeah. right. No, that is a very uh, valuable, it seems to be sort of uh, at first place, it seems to be obvious, but I mean, we do not, I think, put enough attention to that stage and then we end up building something that can break very easily, right? Exactly. I really don't want to finish this conversation. I wish we could talk about so many things and definitely about authenticity. I mean, probably less about LinkedIn, although I was attracted by you think Natalia brand initially, but I mean, you're so much more than this particular brand and uh, hopefully we'll stay connected. And thank you very much for this lovely conversation. Likewise, Larissa, I really enjoyed this and thank you for this beautiful opportunity. <laughs>